What's up, folks? I'm Dan, and welcome to I've Been Meaning to Read That, the show where I read books out loud that I've been meaning to read. Let's go. Guys, if you felt like I left you hanging yesterday in the middle of a chapter, it's because I did. But what you didn't know was that while I was trying to record, my co-host, McDuff, the uh, little gray short-haired cat, was crawling all over me and uh, whining and uh, headbutting me and my cup of water and my computer screen and the mic stand just being a real nuisance. So it took me forever to make that episode. Uh, And for that, uh, I apologize. I apologize on behalf of my very cute cat, McDuff. Uh, I'll put him up on TikTok and Insta for you guys to see here in a little bit. But right now, I've got the cat distracted. He is chilling somewhere else outside of my studio, probably batting a little gray piece of fluff around and pretending it's a bird that he's killed. Cats are so cute when they think they've killed something. But anyways, without further ado, let's get into The Count of Monte Cristo. Danglers was engaged at that moment, presiding over a railroad committee but the meeting was nearly concluded when the name of his visitor was announced. As the Count's title sounded on his ear, he rose, and, addressing his colleagues, who were members of one or the other chamber, he said, "'Gentlemen, pardon me for leaving you so abruptly, but a most ridiculous circumstance has occurred, which is this. Thompson and French, the Roman bankers, have sent to me a certain person calling himself the Count of Monte Cristo, and have given him an unlimited credit with me.' I confess this is the drollest thing I have ever met with in the course of my extensive foreign transactions, and you may readily suppose it has greatly roused my curiosity. I took the trouble this morning to call on the pretended count. If he were a real count, he wouldn't be so rich. But would you believe it? He was not receiving. So the master of Monte Cristo gives himself airs befitting a great millionaire or a capricious beauty. I made inquiries and found that the house on the Champs-Élysées is his own property, and certainly it was very decently kept up, but, pursued Danglers with one of his sinister smiles, an order for unlimited credit calls for something like caution on the part of the banker to whom that order is given. I am very anxious to see this man. I suspect a hoax is intended, but the instigators of it little knew whom they had to deal with. They laugh best who laugh last." Having delivered himself of this pompous address, uttered with a degree of energy that left the baron almost out of breath, he bowed to the assembled party and withdrew to his drawing-room, whose sumptuous furnishings of white and gold had caused a great sensation in the Chaussée d'Antin. It was to this apartment he had desired his guest to be shown, with the purpose of overwhelming him at the sight of so much luxury. He found the Count standing before some copies of Albino and Fattore that had been passed off to the banker as originals but which, mere copies as they were, seemed to feel their degradation in being brought into juxtaposition with the gaudy colors that covered the ceiling. The Count turned round as he heard the entrance of Danglers into the room. With a slight inclination of the head, Danglers signed to the Count to be seated, pointing significantly to a gilded armchair, covered with white satin embroidered with gold. The Count sat. "'I have the honor, I presume, of addressing the Monsieur de Monte Cristo." The Count bowed. "'And I of speaking to Baron Danglers, Chevalier of the Legion of Honor, and member of the Chamber of Deputies?' Monte Cristo repeated all the titles he had read on the Baron's card. Danglers felt the irony and compressed his lips. "'You will, I trust, excuse me, monsieur, for not calling you by your title when I first addressed you,' he said. "'But you are aware that we are living under a popular form of government, and that I am myself a representative of the liberties of the people.' "'So much so,' replied Monte Cristo, "'that while you call yourself Baron, "'you are not willing to call anybody else Count.' "'Upon my word, monsieur,' said Danglars, "'with affected carelessness, "'I attach no sort of value to such empty distinctions, "'but the fact is, I was made Baron, "'and also Chevalier of the Legion of Honor, "'in return for services rendered, but... "'But you have discarded your titles "'after the example set you by Messieurs de Montmorency and Lafayette. "'That was a noble example to follow, monsieur.' "'Why,' replied Danglars, "'not entirely so. "'With the servants, you understand. "'I see. "'To your domestics you are my lord. "'The journalists style you monsieur, "'while your constituents call you citizen. 
These are distinctions very suitable under a constitutional government. I understand perfectly. Again, Danglers bit his lips. He saw that he was no match for Monte Cristo in an argument of this sort, and he therefore hastened to turn to subjects more congenial. Permit me to inform you, Count, said he, bowing, that I have received a letter of advice from Thompson and French of Rome. I'm glad to hear it, Baron, for I must claim the privilege of addressing you after the manner of your servants. I have acquired the bad habit of calling persons by their titles from living in a country where barons are still barons by right of birth. But as regards the letter of advice, I am charmed to find that it has reached you. That will spare me the troublesome and disagreeable task of coming to you for money myself. You have received a regular letter of advice? Yes, said Danglers. But I confess I didn't quite comprehend its meaning. Indeed? And for that reason I did myself the honor of calling upon you in order to beg for an explanation. Go on, monsieur. Here I am, ready to give you any explanation you desire. Why, said Danglers, in the letter, I believe I have it about me. Here he felt in his breast pocket. Yes, here it is. Well, this letter gives the Count of Monte Cristo unlimited credit on our house. Well, Baron, what is there difficult to understand about that? Merely the term unlimited, nothing else, certainly. Is not that word known in France? The people who wrote are Anglo-Germans, you know. Oh, as for the composition of the letter, there is nothing to be said, but as regards the competency of the document, I certainly have doubts. Is it possible? asked the Count, assuming all air and tone of the utmost simplicity and candor. Is it possible that Thompson and French are not looked upon as safe and solvent bankers? Pray tell me what you think, Baron, for I feel uneasy, I can assure you, having some considerable property in their hands. Thompson and French are perfectly solvent, replied Danglers with an almost mocking smile. But the word unlimited in financial affairs is so extremely vague. It is, in fact, unlimited. Precisely what I was about to say, cried Danglers. Now what is vague is doubtful, and it was a wise man who said, When in doubt, keep out. Meaning to say, rejoined Monte Cristo, that however Thompson and French may be inclined to commit acts of imprudence and folly, the Baron Danglers is not disposed to follow their example? Not at all. Plainly enough. Messieurs Thompson and French set no bounds to their engagements, while those of Monsieur Danglers have their limits. He is a wise man, according to his own showing. Monsieur, replied the banker, drawing himself up with a haughty air, the extent of my resources has never yet been questioned. It seems then reserved for me, said Monte Cristo, to be the first to do so. By what right, sir? By right of the objections you have raised, and the explanations you have demanded, which certainly must have some motive. Once more Danglers bit his lips. It was the second time he had been worsted, and this time on his own ground. His forced politeness sat awkwardly upon him, and approached almost to impertinence. Monte Cristo, on the contrary, preserved a graceful suavity of demeanor, aided by a certain degree of simplicity he could assume at pleasure, and thus possess the advantage. Well, sir, resumed Danglars, after a brief silence. I will endeavor to make myself understood by requesting you to inform me for what sum you propose to draw upon me. Why, truly, replied Monte Cristo, determined not to lose an inch of the ground he had gained, my reason for desiring an unlimited credit was precisely because I did not know how much money I might need. The banker thought the time had come for him to take the upper hand. So throwing himself back in his armchair, he said, with an arrogant and purse-proud air, Let me beg of you not to hesitate in naming your wishes. You will then be convinced that the resources of the House of Danglers, however limited, are still equal to meeting the largest demands, and were you even to require a million. I beg your pardon, interposed Monte Cristo. I said a million, replied Danglers, with the confidence of ignorance. But could I do with a million? retorted the Count. My dear sir, if a trifle like that could suffice me, I should never have given myself the trouble of opening an account. A million? Excuse my smiling when you speak of a sum I am in the habit of carrying in my pocketbook or dressing case. And with these words, Monte Cristo took from his pocket a small case containing his visiting cards, and drew forth two orders on the treasury for five hundred thousand francs each, payable at sight to the bearer. 
A man like Dangler's was wholly inaccessible to any gentler method of correction. The effect of the present revelation was stunning. He trembled and was on the verge of apoplexy. The pupils of his eyes, as he gazed at Monte Cristo, dilated horribly. "'Come, come,' said Monte Cristo. "'Confess honestly that you have not perfect confidence in Thompson and French. I understand, and, foreseeing that such might be the case, I took, in spite of my ignorance of affairs, certain precautions. See, here are two similar letters that you have yourself received, one from the house of Arstein in Escoles of Vienna to Baron Rothschild, the other drawn by Baring of London upon Monsieur Lafitte. Now, sir, you have but to say the word, and I will spare you all uneasiness by presenting my letter of credit to one or other of these two firms. The blow had struck home, and Danglars was entirely vanquished. With a trembling hand, he took the two letters from the Count, who held them carelessly between finger and thumb, and proceeded to scrutinize the signatures. With a minuteness that the Count might have regarded as insulting, had it not suited his present purpose to mislead the banker. "'Oh, sir,' said Danglars, after he had convinced himself of the authenticity of the documents he held, and rising as if to salute the power of gold personified in the man before him. Three letters of unlimited credit? I can be no longer mistrustful, but you must pardon me, my dear Count, for confessing to some degree of astonishment. Nay, answered Monte Cristo with the most gentlemanly air. Tis not for such trifling sums as these that your banking house is to be incommoded. Then... You can let me have some money, can you not? Whatever you say, my dear Count, I am at your orders. Why, replied Monte Cristo, since we mutually understand each other, for such I presume is the case, Danglars bowed assentingly, you are quite sure that not a lurking doubt or suspicion lingers in your mind? My dear Count, exclaimed Danglars, I never for an instant entertained such a feeling towards you. No, you merely wish to be convinced, nothing more. But now that we have come to so clear an understanding, and that all distrust and suspicion are laid at rest, we may as well fix a sum as the probable expenditure of the first year. Suppose we say uh, six millions to— Six millions? gasped Danglars. So be it. Then, if I should require more, continued Monte Cristo in a careless manner, why, of course, I should draw upon you, but my present intention is not to remain in France more than a year, and during that period I scarcely think I shall exceed the sum I mentioned. However, we shall see. Be kind enough, then, to send me five hundred thousand francs tomorrow. I shall be at home till midday, or if not, I will leave a receipt with my steward. The money you desire shall be at your house by ten o'clock tomorrow morning, my dear Count, replied Danglars. How would you like to have it? In gold, silver, or notes? "'Half in gold, and the other half in banknotes, if you please,' said the Count, rising from his seat. "'I must confess to you, Count,' said Danglars, "'that I have hitherto imagined myself acquainted with the degree of all the great fortunes of Europe, "'and still wealth such as yours has been wholly unknown to me. "'May I presume to ask whether you have long possessed it?' "'It has been in the family a very long while,' returned Monte Cristo. A sort of treasure expressly forbidden to be touched for a certain period of years, during which the accumulated interest has doubled the capital. The period appointed by the testator for the disposal of these riches occurred only a short time ago, and they have only been employed by me within the last few years. Your ignorance on the subject, therefore, is easily accounted for. However, you will be better informed as to me and my possessions ere long." and the Count, while pronouncing these latter words, accompanied them with one of those ghastly smiles that used to strike terror into poor Franz d'Apinay. "'With your tastes and means of gratifying them,' continued Danglars, "'you will exhibit a splendor that must effectually put us poor miserable millionaires quite in the shade. If I mistake not, you are an admirer of paintings, at least I judge so from the attention you appear to be bestowing on mine when I enter the room.' If you will permit me, I shall be happy to show you my picture gallery, composed entirely of works by the ancient masters, warranted as such. Not a modern picture among them. I cannot endure the modern school of painting. You are perfectly right in objecting to them for this one great fault, that they have not yet had time to become old. Or will you allow me to show you several fine statues by Thorwaldsen, Bartoloni, and Canova? All foreign artists, for, as you may perceive, I think but very indifferently of our French sculptors. You have a right to be unjust to them, monsieur. They are your compatriots. But all this may come later, when we shall be better known to each other. 
For the present, I will confine myself, if perfectly agreeable to you, to introducing you to the Baroness Stanglers. Excuse my impatience, my dear Count, but a client like you is almost like a member of the family. Monte Cristo bowed, in sign that he accepted the proffered honor. Danglers rang and was answered by a servant in a showy livery. "'Is the Baroness at home?' inquired Danglers. "'Yes, my lord,' answered the man. "'And alone?' "'No, my lord. Madame has visitors.' "'Have you any objection to meet any persons who may be with Madame, or do you desire to preserve a strict incognito?' "'No, indeed,' replied Monte Cristo with a smile. I do not arrogate to myself the right of so doing. And who is with Madame? Monsieur de Bray? inquired Danglars with an air of indulgence and good nature that made Monte Cristo smile, acquainted as he was with the secrets of the banker's domestic life. Yes, my lord, replied the servant. Monsieur de Bray is with Madame. Danglars nodded his head, then, turning to Monte Cristo, said, Monsieur Lucien de Bray is an old friend of ours and private secretary to the Minister of the Interior. As for my wife, I must tell you, she lowered herself by marrying me, for she belongs to one of the most ancient families in France. Her maiden name was de Servier, and her first husband was Colonel de Marquis of Nargon. I have not the honor of knowing Madame Danglars, but I have already met Monsieur Lucien de Bray. Ah, indeed, said Danglars. And where was that? At the house of Monsieur de Morcerf. Aha, you are acquainted with the young Vicount, are you? We were together a good deal during the carnival at Rome. True, true, cried Danglars. Let me see, have I not heard talk of some strange adventure with bandits or thieves hidden ruins and of his having had a miraculous escape? I forget how, but I know he used to amuse my wife and daughter by telling them about it after his return from Italy. Her ladyship is waiting to receive you, gentlemen, said the servant, who had gone to inquire the pleasure of his mistress. With your permission, said Danglars, bowing. I will precede you to show you the way. By all means, replied Monte Cristo, I follow you. End of chapter 46 Chapter 47 The Dappled Greys The Baron, followed by the Count, traversed a long series of apartments in which the prevailing characteristics were heavy magnificence and the gaudiness of ostentatious wealth, until he reached the boudoir of Madame Danglars, a small octagonal shaped room hung with pink satin covered with white indian muslin the chairs were of ancient workmanship and materials over the doors were painted sketches of shepherds and shepherdesses after the style and manner of boucher and at each side pretty medallions and crayons harmonizing well with the furnishings of this charming apartment the only one throughout the great mansion in which any distinctive taste prevailed the truth was it had been entirely overlooked in the plan arranged and followed out by Monsieur Danglars and his architect, who had been selected to aid the Baron in the great work of improvement solely because he was the most fashionable and celebrated decorator of the day. The decorations of the boudoir had then been left entirely to Madame Danglars and Lucien de Bray. Madame Danglars, however, while possessing a great admiration for the antique, as it was understood during the time of the Directory, entertained the most sovereign contempt for the simple elegance of his wife's favorite sitting-room, where, by the way, he was never permitted to intrude, unless, indeed, he excused his own appearance by ushering in some more agreeable visitor than himself, and even then he had rather the air and manner of a person who was himself introduced than that of being the presenter of another, his reception being cordial or frigid, in proportion as the person who accompanied him chanced to please or displease the baroness. Madame Danglars, who, although past the first bloom of youth, was still strikingly handsome, was now seated at the piano, a most elaborate piece of cabinet and inlaid work, while Lucien de Bray, standing before a small work table, was standing over the pages of an album. Lucien had found time, preparatory to the Count's arrival, to relate many particulars respecting him to Madame Danglars. It will be remembered that Monte Cristo had made a lively impression on the minds of all the party assembled at the breakfast given by Albert de Morcerf, and although de Bray was not in the habit of yielding to such feelings, he had never been able to shake off the powerful influence excited in his mind by the impressive look and manner of the Count. Consequently, the description given by Lucien to the Baroness bore the highly colored tinge of his own heated imagination. Although excited by the wonderful stories related of the Count by de Morcerf, 
it is no wonder that Madame Danglars eagerly listened to, and fully credited, all the additional circumstances detailed by Debray. This posing at the piano and over the album was only a little ruse adopted by way of precaution. A most gracious welcome and unusual smile were bestowed on Monsieur Danglars. The Count, in return for his gentlemanly bow, received a formal, though graceful, courtesy, while Lucien exchanged with the Count a sort of distant recognition, and with Danglars a free and easy nod. Baroness, said Danglars, give me leave to present to you the Count of Monte Cristo, who has been most warmly recommended to me by my correspondents in Rome. I need but mention one fact to make all the ladies in Paris court his notice, and that is, that he has come to take up his abode in Paris for a year, during which brief period he proposes to spend six millions. That means balls, dinners, and lawn parties without end, in all of which I trust the Count will remember us, as he may depend upon it, we shall him, in our humble entertainments. In spite of the gross flattery and coarseness of this address, Madame Danglars could not forbear gazing with considerable interest on a man capable of spending six million in twelve months, and who had selected Paris for the scene of his princely extravagance. "'And when did you arrive here?' inquired she. "'Yesterday morning, madam.' "'Coming, as usual, I presume, from the extreme end of the globe? Pardon me, at least such I have heard is your custom.' "'Nay, madame, this time I have merely come from Cadiz.' You have selected a most unfavorable moment for your first visit. Paris is a horrible place in summer. Balls, parties, and fates are over. The Italian opera is in London, the French opera everywhere except in Paris. As for the Théâtre Francais, you know, of course, that is nowhere. The only amusements left us are the indifferent races at the Champ de Mars and Satory. Do you propose entering any horses at either of these races, Count? I shall do whatever they do at Paris, madame, if I have the good fortune to find someone who will initiate me into the prevalent ideas of amusement. Are you fond of horses, Count? I have passed a considerable part of my life in the East, madame, and you are doubtless aware that the Orientals value only two things, the fine breeding of their horses and the beauty of their women. Nay, Count, said the Baroness, it would have been somewhat more gallant to have placed the ladies first. You see, madame, how rightly I spoke when I said I required a preceptor to guide me in all my sayings and doings here. At this instant, the favorite attendant of madame Danglars entered the boudoir. Approaching her mistress, she spoke some words in an undertone. Madame Danglars turned very pale, then exclaimed, I cannot believe it. The thing is impossible. I assure you, madame, replied the woman, it is as I have said. Turning impatiently towards her husband, Madame Danglars demanded, "'Is this true?' "'Is what true, madame?' inquired Danglars, visibly agitated. "'What my maid tells me.' "'But what does she tell you?' "'That when my coachman was about to harness the horses to my carriage, "'he discovered that they had been removed from the stables without his knowledge. "'I desire to know what is the meaning of this.' "'Be kind enough, madame, to listen to me,' said Danglars. Oh, yes, I will listen, monsieur, for I am most curious to hear what explanation you will give. These two gentlemen shall decide between us, but first I will state the case to them. Gentlemen, continued the baroness, among the ten horses in the stables of Baron Danglars are two that belong exclusively to me, a pair of the handsomest and most spirited creatures to be found in Paris. But to you, at least, monsieur de Bray, I need not give a further description because to you my beautiful pair of dappled greys were well known. Well, I had promised Madame de Villefort the loan of my carriage to drive tomorrow to the Bois, but when my coachman goes to fetch the greys from the stables they are gone, positively gone. No doubt Monsieur Danglars has sacrificed them to the selfish consideration of gaining some thousands of paltry francs. Oh, what a detestable crew they are, these mercenary speculators! Madame, replied Danglars. The horses were not sufficiently quiet for you. They were scarcely four years old, and they made me extremely uneasy on your account. Nonsense, retorted the Baroness. You could not have entertained any alarm on the subject, because you are perfectly well aware that I have had for a month in my service the very best coachman in Paris. But perhaps you have disposed of the coachman as well as the horses? My dear love, 
Pray do not say any more about them, and I promise you another pair exactly like them in appearance, only more quiet and steady. The baroness shrugged her shoulders with an air of ineffable contempt, while her husband, affecting not to observe this unconjugal gesture, turned towards Monte Cristo and said, Upon my word, Count, I'm quite sorry not to have met you sooner. You are setting up an establishment, of course? Why, yes, replied the Count. I should have liked to have made you the offer of these horses. I have almost given them away as it is, but, as I before said, I was anxious to get rid of them upon any terms. They were only fit for a young man. I am much obliged by your kind intentions toward me, said Monte Cristo, but this morning I purchased a very excellent pair of carriage horses, and I do not think they were dear. Here, uh, there they are. Come, Monsieur de Bray, you are a connoisseur, I believe. Let me have your opinion upon them. As de Bray walked towards the window, Danglars approached his wife. I could not tell you before others, said he in a low tone, the reason of my parting with the horses, but a most enormous price was offered me this morning for them. Some madman or fool, bent on ruining himself as fast as he can, actually sent his steward to me to purchase them at any cost, and the fact is, I have gained sixteen thousand francs by the sale of them. Come, don't look so angry, and you shall have four thousand francs of the money to do what you like with, and Eugenie shall have two thousand. There, what do you think now of the affair? Wasn't I right to part with the horses? Madame Dangler surveyed her husband with a look of withering contempt. Great heavens! suddenly exclaimed Debray. What is it? asked the baroness. I cannot be mistaken. There are your horses. The very animals we were speaking of, harnessed to the Count's carriage. My dappled greys? demanded the baroness, springing to the window. "'Tis indeed they,' said she. Danglars looked absolutely stupefied. "'How very singular!' cried Monte Cristo with well-feigned astonishment. "'I cannot believe it,' murmured the banker. Madame Danglars whispered a few words in the ear of Debray, who approached Monte Cristo, saying, "'The baroness wishes to know what you paid her husband for the horses.' "'I scarcely know,' replied the Count. It was a little surprise prepared for me by my steward, and cost me, well, somewhere about thirty thousand francs. Debray conveyed the Count's reply to the Baroness. Poor Danglars looked so crestfallen and discomfited that Monte Cristo assumed a pitying air towards him. See, said the Count, how very ungrateful women are. Your kind attention in providing for the safety of the Baroness by disposing of the horses does not seem to have made the least impression on her. But so it is. A woman will often, from mere willfulness, prefer that which is dangerous to that which is safe. Therefore, in my opinion, my dear Baron, the best and easiest way is to leave them to their fancies and allow them to act as they please, and then, if any mischief follows, why, at least they have no one to blame but themselves." Danglars made no reply. He was occupied in anticipations of the coming scene between himself and the Baroness, whose frowning brow, like that of Olympic Jove, predicted a storm. Debray, who perceived the gathering clouds and felt no desire to witness the explosion of Madame Dangler's rage, suddenly remembered an appointment which compelled him to take his leave, while Monte Cristo, unwilling by prolonging his stay to destroy the advantages he hoped to obtain, made a farewell bow and departed, leaving Dangler's to endure the angry reproaches of his wife. Excellent, murmured Monte Cristo to himself as he came away. All has gone according to my wishes. The domestic peace of this family is henceforth in my hands. Now then, to play another master stroke by which I shall gain the heart of both husband and wife. Delightful. Still, added he, amid all this I have not yet been presented to Mademoiselle Eugenie Danglars, whose acquaintance I have not been able to make. But, he went on with his peculiar smile, I am here in Paris and have plenty of time before me. By and by will do for that. With these reflections he entered his carriage and returned home. Two hours afterwards, Madame Danglars received a most flattering epistle from the Count, in which he entreated her to receive back her favorite, Dappled Greys, protesting that he could not endure the idea of making his entry into the Parisian world of fashion with the knowledge that his splendid equipage had been obtained at the price of a lovely woman's regrets. The horses were sent back wearing the same harness she had seen on them in the morning, only, by the Count's orders, in the center of each rosette that adorned either side of their heads, had been fastened a large diamond. To Danglars, Monte Cristo also wrote, 
requesting him to excuse the whimsical gift of a capricious millionaire, and to beg the baroness to pardon the eastern fashion adopted in the return of the horses. During the evening, Monte Cristo quitted Paris for Autiel, accompanied by Ali. The following day, about three o'clock, a single blow struck on the gong summoned Ali to the presence of the Count. Ali, observed his master as the Nubian entered the chamber, you have frequently explained to me how more than commonly skillful you are in throwing the lasso, have you not? Ali drew himself up proudly and then returned a sign to the affirmative. I thought I didn't make a mistake. With your lasso, you could stop an ox? Again, Ali repeated his affirmative gesture. Or a tiger? Ali bowed his head in token of assent. A lion, even? Ali sprung forwards, imitating the action of one throwing the lasso, then of a strangled lion. I understand, said Monte Cristo. You wish to tell me you have hunted the lion? Ali smiled with triumphant pride as he signified that he had indeed both chased and captured many lions. But do you believe you could arrest the progress of two horses rushing forwards with ungovernable fury? The Nubian smiled. It is well, said Monte Cristo. Then listen to me. Ere long, a carriage will dash past here, drawn by a pair of dappled gray horses that you saw me with yesterday. Now, at the risk of your own life, you must manage to stop those horses before my door. Ali descended to the street and marked a straight line on the pavement immediately at the entrance of the house, and then pointed out the line he had traced to the Count, who was watching him. The Count patted him gently on the shoulder, his usual mode of praising Ali, who, pleased and gratified with the commission assigned him, walked calmly towards a projecting stone forming the angle of the street and house, and, seating himself thereon, began to smoke his chibouque, while Monte Cristo re-entered his dwelling, perfectly assured of the success of his plan. Still, as five o'clock approached, and the carriage was momentarily expected by the Count, the indication of more than common impatience and uneasiness might be observed in his manner. He stationed himself in a room commanding a view of the street, pacing the chamber with restless steps, stopping merely to listen from time to time for the sound of approaching wheels, then to cast an anxious glance at Ali. But the regularity with which the Nubian puffed forth the smoke of his chibouque proved that he at least was wholly absorbed in the enjoyment of his favorite occupation. Suddenly, a distant sound of rapidly advancing wheels was heard, and almost immediately a carriage appeared, drawn by a pair of wild, ungovernable horses, while the terrified coachman strove in vain to restrain their furious speed. In the vehicle was a young woman and a child of about seven or eight clasped in each other's arms. Terror seemed to have deprived them even of the power of uttering a cry. The carriage creaked and rattled as it flew over the rough stones, and the slightest obstacle under the wheels could have caused disaster. But it kept on in the middle of the road, and those who saw it pass uttered cries of terror. Ali suddenly cast aside his chibouque, drew the lasso from his pocket, threw it so skillfully as to catch the forelegs of the near horse in its triple fold, and suffered himself to be dragged on for a few steps by the violence of the shock. Then the animal fell over on the pole, which snapped, and therefore prevented the other horse from pursuing its way. Gladly availing himself of this opportunity, the coachman leapt from his box, but Ali had promptly seized the nostrils of the second horse and held them in his iron grasp, till the beast, snorting with pain, sunk beside his companion. All this was achieved in much less time than is occupied in the recital. The brief space had, however, been sufficient for a man, followed by a number of servants, to rush from the house before which the accident had occurred, and, as the coachman opened the door of the carriage, to take from it a lady who was convulsively grasping the cushions with one hand, while with the other she pressed to her bosom the young boy who had lost consciousness. Monte Cristo carried them both to the salon and deposited them on a sofa. "'Compose yourself, madam,' said he. "'All danger is over.' The woman looked up at these words, and, with a glance far more expressive than any entreaties could have been, pointed to her child, who still continued insensible. "'I understand the nature of your alarms, madame,' said the Count, carefully examining the child. "'But I assure you there is not the slightest occasion for uneasiness. Your little charge has not received the least injury, his insensibility is merely the effects of terror, and will soon pass. "'Are you quite sure you do not say so to tranquilize my fears? See how deadly pale he is. My child, my darling Edward, speak to your mother. Open your dear eyes and look on me once again. Oh, sir, in pity send for a physician. My whole fortune shall not be thought too much for the recovery of my boy.' 
With a calm smile and a gentle wave of the hand, Monte Cristo signed to the distracted mother to lay aside her apprehensions. Then, opening a casket that stood near, he drew forth a phial of bohemian glass encrusted with gold, containing a liquid of the color of blood, of which he let fall a single drop on the child's lips. Scarcely had it reached them, ere the boy, though still pale as marble, opened his eyes and eagerly gazed around him. At this, the delight of the mother was almost frantic. "'Where am I?' exclaimed she. "'And to whom am I indebted for so happy a termination to my late dreadful alarm?' "'Madame,' answered the Count, "'you are under the roof of one who esteems himself most fortunate in having been able to save you from a further continuance of your sufferings.' "'My wretched curiosity has brought all this about,' pursued the lady. "'All Paris rung with the praises of Madame Dangler's beautiful horses, "'and I had the folly to desire to know "'whether they really merited the high praise given to them.' "'Is it possible,' exclaimed the Count, "'with well-feigned astonishment, "'that these horses belong to the Baroness?' "'They do indeed. "'May I inquire if you are acquainted with Madame Dangler's?' "'I have that honor, "'and my happiness at your escape from the danger that threatened you "'is redoubled by the consciousness "'that I have been the unwilling and the intentional cause "'of all the peril you have incurred. "'I yesterday purchased these horses of the Baron, "'but as the Baroness evidently regretted parting with them, "'I ventured to send them back to her, "'with a request that she would gratify me "'by accepting them from my hands.' "'You are then, doubtless, the Count of Monte Cristo, "'of whom Hermione has talked to me so much?' "'You have rightly guessed, madame,' replied the Count. "'And I am Madame Heloise de Vilfort.' "'The Count bowed with the air of a person "'who hears a name for the first time. "'How grateful will Monsieur de Vilfort be for all your goodness! "'How thankfully will he acknowledge that to you alone "'he owes the existence of his wife and child. "'Most certainly, but for the prompt assistance of your intrepid servant,' this dear child and myself must have both perished. Indeed, I still shudder at the fearful danger you were placed in. I trust you will allow me to recompense worthily the devotion of your man? I beseech you, madam, replied Monte Cristo, not to spoil Ali either by too great praise or rewards. I cannot allow him to acquire the habit of expecting to be recompensed for every trifling service he may render. Ali is my slave, and in saving your life he was but discharging his duty to me. "'Nay,' interposed Madame de Villefort, on whom the authoritative style adopted by the Count made a deep impression. "'Nay, but consider that to preserve my life he has risked his own. "'His life, madame, belongs not to him. "'It is mine in return for my having myself saved him from death.' Madame de Villefort made no further reply. Her mind was utterly absorbed in the contemplation of the person who, from the first instant she saw him, had made so powerful during the evident preoccupation of Madame de Villefort, Monte Cristo scrutinized the features and appearances of the boy she kept folded in her arms, lavishing on him the most tender endearments. The child was small for his age and unnaturally pale. A mass of straight black hair, defying all attempts to train or curl it, fell over his projecting forehead and hung down to his shoulders, giving increased vivacity to eyes already sparkling with a youthful love of mischief and fondness for every forbidden enjoyment. His mouth was large, and the lips, which had not yet regained their color, were particularly thin. In fact, the deep and crafty look, giving a predominant expression to the child's face, belonged rather to a boy of twelve or fourteen than to one so young. His first movement was to free himself by a violent push from the encircling arms of his mother, and to rush forward to the casket from whence the Count had taken the file of elixir. Then, without asking permission of anyone, he proceeded, in all the willfulness of a spoiled child unaccustomed to restrain either whims or caprices, to pull the corks out of all the bottles. "'Touch nothing, my little friend,' cried the Count eagerly. "'Some of those liquids are not only dangerous to taste, but even to inhale.' Madame de Villefort became very pale, and, seizing her son's arm, drew him anxiously towards her. But once satisfied of his safety, she also cast a brief but expressive glance on the casket, which was not lost upon the Count. At this moment Ali entered. At sight of him, Madame de Villefort uttered an expression of pleasure, and, holding the child still closer towards her, she said, "'Edward, dearest, do you see that good man? He has shown very great courage and resolution, for he exposed his own life to stop the horses that were running away with us, and would certainly have dashed the carriage to pieces.' Thank him, then, my child, in your very best manner. 
for, had he not come to our aid, neither you nor I would have been alive to speak our thanks. The child stuck out his lips and turned away his head in a disdainful manner, saying, He's too ugly. The Count smiled as if the child bade fair to realize his hopes, while Madame de Vilfort reprimanded her son with a gentleness and moderation very far from conveying the least idea of a fault having been committed. This lady, said the Count, speaking to Ali in the Arabic language, is desirous that her son should thank you for saving both their lives, but the boy refuses, saying you are too ugly. Ali turned his intelligent countenance towards the boy, on whom he gazed without any apparent emotion, but the spasmodic working of the nostrils showed to the practiced eye of Monte Cristo that the Arab had been wounded to the heart. "'Will you permit me to inquire?' said Madame de Villefort, as she arose to take her leave. "'Whether you usually reside here?' "'No, I do not,' replied Monte Cristo. "'It is a small place I have purchased quite lately. My place of abode is number 30, Avenue de champs Elysees. But I see you have quite recovered from your fright, and are, no doubt, desirous of returning home. Anticipating your wishes, I have desired the same horses you came with to be put to one of my carriages, and Ali, he whom you think so very ugly, continued he, addressing the boy with a smiling air, will have the honor of driving you home, while your coachman remains here to attend to the necessary repairs of your calish. As soon as that important business is concluded, I will have a pair of my own horses harnessed to convey it directly to Madame Dangler's. "'I dare not return with those dreadful horses,' said Madame de Villefort. "'You will see,' replied Monte Cristo, "'that they will be as different as possible in the hands of Ali. "'With him they will be gentle and docile as lambs.' "'Ali had, indeed, given proof of this, "'for, approaching the animals, "'who had been got upon their legs with considerable difficulty, "'he rubbed their foreheads and nostrils "'with a sponge soaked in aromatic vinegar "'and wiped off the sweat and foam that covered their mouths.' Then, commencing a loud whistling noise, he rubbed them well all over their bodies for several minutes. Then, undisturbed by the noisy crowd collected round the broken carriage, Ali quietly harnessed the pacified animals to the Count's chariot, took the reins in his hands, and mounted the box, when, to the utter astonishment of those who had witnessed the ungovernable spirit and maddened speed of the same horses, he was actually compelled to apply his whip in no very gentle manner before he could induce them to start. And even then, all that could be obtained from the celebrated dappled greys, now changed into a couple of dull, sluggish, stupid brutes, was a slow, pottering pace, kept up with so much difficulty that Madame de Villefort was more than two hours returning to her residence in the Faubourg saint Honore. Scarcely had the first congratulations upon her marvelous escape been gone through when she wrote the following letter to Madame Danglars. Dear Hermione, I have just had a wonderful escape from the most imminent danger, and I owe my safety to the very Count of Monte Cristo we were talking about yesterday, but whom I little expected to see today. I remember how unmercifully I laughed at what I considered your eulogistic and exaggerated praises of him, but I have now ample cause to admit that your enthusiastic description of this wonderful man fell far short of his merits. Your horses got as far as Ranala when they darted forward like mad things, and galloped away at so fearful a rate that there seemed no other prospect for myself and my poor Edward but that of being dashed to pieces against the first object that impeded their progress, when a strange-looking man, an Arab, a Negro, or a Nubian, at least a black of some nation or other, at a signal from the Count, whose domestic he is, suddenly seized and stopped the infuriated animals, even at the risk of being trampled to death himself and certainly he must have had a most wonderful escape. The Count then hastened to us, and took us into his house, where he speedily recalled my poor Edward to life. He sent us home in his own carriage. Yours will be returned to you tomorrow. You will find your horses in bad condition from the results of this accident. They seem thoroughly stupefied, as if sulky and vexed at having been conquered by man. The Count, however, has commissioned me to assure you that two or three days' rest, with plenty of barley for their sole food during that time, will bring them back to as fine, that is, as terrifying a condition as they were in yesterday. Adieu! I cannot return you many thanks for the drive of yesterday, but, after all, I ought not to blame you for the misconduct of your horses, more especially as it procured me the pleasure of an introduction to the Count of Monte Cristo and certainly that illustrious personage, apart from the millions he is said to be so very anxious to dispose of, seemed to me one of those curiously interesting problems I, for one, delight in solving at any risk, 
even if it were to necessitate another drive to the bois behind your horses. Edward endured the accident with miraculous courage. He did not utter a single cry, but fell lifeless into my arms. Nor did a tear fall from his eyes after it was over. I doubt not you will consider these praises the result of blind maternal affection, but there is a soul of iron in that delicate, fragile body. Valentine sends many affectionate remembrances to your dear Eugenie. I embrace you with all my heart. Heloise de Vilfort P.S. Do pray contrive some means for me to meet the Count of Monte Cristo at your house. I must and will see him again. I have just made Monsieur de Vilfort promise to call on him, and I hope the visit will be returned. That night, the adventure at Autiel was talked of everywhere. Albert related it to his mother, Chateau Renaud recounted it at the jockey club, and de Bray detailed it at length in the salons of the minister. Even Beauchamp accorded twenty lines in his journal to the relation of the Count's courage and gallantry, thereby celebrating him as the greatest hero of the day in the eyes of all the feminine members of the aristocracy. Vast was the crowd of visitors and inquiring friends who left their names at the residence of Madame de Vilfort with the design of renewing their visit at the right moment, of hearing from her lips all the interesting circumstances of this most romantic adventure. As for Monsieur de Vilfort, he fulfilled the predictions of Heloise to the letter, donned his dress suit, drew on a pair of white gloves, ordered the servants to attend the carriage dressed in their full livery, and drove that same night to number 30 and the Avenue des champs Élysées. End of chapter 47 and end of volume 2. And cut. That's a wrap, folks. Thanks for listening to today's episode of I've Been Meaning to Read That with me, your host, Dan. If you want to learn more about the show, you can follow us on Instagram at Meaning to Read and TikTok at I've Been Meaning. If you want to support the show to help keep it going, you can find me on Venmo at Dingus Donut, D-I-N-G-U-S-D-O-N-U-T. Supporters get a shout out on the show and even more important, get to vote on the next book that we read. No matter what, I'll see you for our next episode. Until then, read those books you've been meaning to read and have a lovely, lovely day.